A strange man staggers up to a woman's front door, dazed and bloody. He just stared, and then he walked away. Hours later, a passerby finds him in the woods, dead. And I looked, and I'm like, whoa, that looks bad. I mean, what is going on here? And then, a seemingly healthy mother of two dies without warning. The kids are devastated. The husband's devastated. She's now in my morgue, and we don't know why she died. Altered lives, baffling medical mysteries, shocking revelations. These are the everyday cases of Dr. G, medical examiner. It's 8 a.m. at the District 9 Orange Osceola County Medical Examiner's Office. But Dr. Jan Garavaglia is already hard at work. Oh, did, did my investigators have it? He does have an enlarged heart. Yeah, the cause of death is pending. No. It might be, you know, weeks and sometimes, you know, months. I've got families calling, wanting answers. I don't know why some of the micros are late. I'm going to have to go to cut more tissue. You know, there's people to call. Just thinking about what else I could do and multiply that by numerous cases. New ones coming in every day. Today's newest body arrives under suspicious circumstances, even by morgue standards. And although Dr. G is extremely busy, this case demands her immediate attention. Wow. It's almost noon, and Deer Park, Florida resident Debbie Balcom is busy fixing lunch when she hears a knock at the front door. She assumes it's just one of the neighbors dropping by for a visit. But what she sees on her front stoop comes as a complete shock. A disoriented, disheveled, and bleeding young man. Must have been scary because he had blood on his shirt. It looks like he's been beaten up. And he just stared at her, and then he walked away. Shaken by the encounter, Debbie quickly locks the door. But neither she nor anyone else in the apartment complex crosses paths with the man again. In fact, he seems to disappear entirely. Until a few hours later, when recently retired Jim Weisberg goes out for his afternoon walk. As he passes through the woods beside Debbie's home, he gets the shock of his life. The body of a man on the ground, dead. Jim calls 911, and within minutes, the police arrive on the scene. It's unclear what's going on here. The detectives are very suspicious that there's foul play. The homicide unit's first step is to locate the man's wallet. His name is Gregory Flynn. And a background check reveals another, more curious fact. He doesn't live anywhere in these houses. He doesn't live in the apartment complex. And a few minutes later, police make another discovery. The investigators looked around. They found his, uh, what appears to be his car, in a ditch in this wooded area. This wooded area separates these houses from an apartment complex. Looking for possible witnesses to Gregory Flynn's death, detectives begin knocking on apartment doors. Canvassing the area, they found out that he was seen uh, driving about four hours earlier. And it isn't long before the detectives find Debbie Balcom. She views Greg Flynn's body and identifies him as the man who came to her door hours earlier. Meanwhile, medical investigator Jack Cuccia of the District 9 morgue arrives on the scene. He takes photographs of the body for Dr. G and prepares it for transport to the morgue. But the detectives need more information. At that point, they really didn't know what they were dealing with until we were able to see if there was any uh, traumatic injury to him. 
the detectives want permission to examine Greg's body for chest and face wounds on the scene. The law enforcement agencies, they do not have the authority to examine the body, remove the clothing without making contact with the medical examiner because we don't want to lose any trace evidence or disturb the wound in any way until the doctor has uh, seen that uh, firsthand. Jack Cuccia calls Dr. G. Dr. G. He explains the situation and asks for permission to inspect the body. Okay, Dr. G, thank you. And I said, fine, you know, examine him at the scene. Turning over the body, they reveal quite a sight. Greg Flynn's right eye looks swollen and his face is bloody. There's also a large amount of blood on his shirt. So I said, just go ahead and bring him in. We'll x-ray him um, and look for the wounds. Once Greg Flynn's body is on its way to the morgue, detectives make contact with his ex-wife, Rosanna. Hello. According to his ex-wife, he didn't suffer from any major diseases or chronic health problems. Next, an officer calls Greg Flynn's brother, Sean. And as soon as they inform him of Greg's death, Sean levels a stunning accusation. The brother believes that the ex-wife had something to do with his death. The detectives don't know if Sean is right about Greg's ex-wife, but they do suspect foul play. Detectives are highly suspicious that this is a homicide. They're really waiting for me to give them an answer. But Dr. G has questions of her own about his death. Why was he acting so strange? Why did uh, he go up to that apartment and just stare? It's just very odd. Dr. G wonders if someone ran him off the road. The car had only minor damage, but it's possible that Greg sustained injuries in the crash. Did he have a head injury? Maybe he hit uh, something when he stopped suddenly. It's possible that the crash was an accident. But at this stage, one thing is clear. All clues point to murder. Knife wound, gunshot wound, blows to the head. And that's what we're really looking for right now in the external examination. The first thing Dr. G notices about Greg Flynn is how well-dressed he is. But Greg's button-down Oxford shirt is heavily stained with blood. Oh, mm, boy. The blood pattern was odd. It was in front of his shirt only and at the ends of his uh, sleeves. The other odd thing is that his clothes were also wet. There is a small wet creek in those woods, but how did he get wet? But the strangest thing about Greg Flynn isn't his clothes. It's his skin. It's slipping off. He's already starting to show signs of early decomposition. That's very odd. Greg's been dead less than 10 hours, but when it comes to the stages of death, he's way ahead of the curve. Skin slippage normally doesn't appear until 48 hours post-mortem. When we see somebody decomposing that quickly, we really worry that maybe he had an infection or an elevated uh, body temperature prior to death. But that wouldn't explain the blood soaking Greg Flynn's shirt front or his battered face. He's got a huge bruise over here. That looks bad. He's got dried blood. He's got this kind of big swollen eyelid with a lot of like little abrasions. He looks like he's been in a fight, and this makes Dr. G even more suspicious of possible foul play. But as she looks closer, Dr. G recognizes what did this to him, and it wasn't human. When you look closely, you see small rodent um, scratches and excoriations. But on Greg's face, the damage done by the animal activity is mainly superficial. And I still can't explain this blood on his shirt. Dr. G suspects it might have come from a nosebleed or mouth wound. So she carefully checks both potential sources. 
there's really no blood in his nose. And I don't see a blood in his mouth. I don't know where that blood's coming from. As Dr. G moves down the body looking for a major wound, she notices dozens of tiny cuts crisscrossing Greg's forearms and hands. He really was scratched up uh, quite badly. Was Greg running away from someone? And if so, who? And where did the blood soaking his shirt come from? The answers to these questions may lie under his clothes. A little 22 can kill you, and my investigator may not see that, particularly if there's a lot of blood. May have a small stab wound. At this point, it can be anything. During the external exam of Gregory Flynn's body, Dr. G found scratches that suggest he may have been running from someone before he died. Greg's brother believes he was murdered. And now, Dr. G is looking for the source of the blood soaking Greg's shirt. And I'm taking his clothes off and I'm examining inch by inch, where could this blood be coming from? She searches the entire body for a small bullet or knife wound, but what she finds surprises her. I don't see any wounds that are accounting for all that blood. At this point, I don't know how he died. It's very odd. I'm hoping I find something internally. All righty. Dr. G opens Greg Flynn's chest with a Y incision and begins searching for evidence of trauma. I'm looking for evidence of contusion to his chest, maybe internal trauma to the organs. As a first step, she removes Greg's chest plate, looking for free blood and other signs of injury but she doesn't find anything of significance in the abdominal or chest cavity. The source of all that blood is becoming more mysterious by the moment. All Dr. G can do now is continue searching for clues within his internal organs. Next, she extracts the heart and prepares to dissect it. But right away, she notices a striking abnormality. He had a significant uh, narrowing to his right coronary artery. It was at least an 80% narrowing. Odd for someone that's a relatively young age. This narrowing could have caused a heart attack, which could explain why Greg drove his car into a ditch but not his behavior afterwards. I would not expect him to be acting odd like that just because he's got the heart disease. He still has enough energy to go running through the woods. I wouldn't really expect him to be doing that with a coronary event. Uh, so it's not making sense. Other than signs of decomposition, the rest of Greg's heart looks normal. Dr. G's next stop is the lungs. And what she sees here is disturbing. You could also see that they were starting to decompose. In addition to Greg's lungs, his other organs are clearly beginning to decay. His spleen is soft and friable. His uh, bowels are starting to turn green. These are all early signs of decomp. Greg's accelerated decomposition is extremely unusual. It could be a sign that he was sick with a severe infection right before he died. People who are infected and have high fevers can start having early decomposition. To confirm an infection, Dr. G takes blood samples to be tested for the presence of bacteria. And as standard practice, 
Greg's blood will also be screened for drugs and alcohol at a toxicology lab. By the end of the internal exam, Dr. G still has no idea how Greg Flynn died. The chest and abdomen just didn't tell us too much. And as she readies her scalpel for the cranial exam, she's hoping the brain and skull will yield the clue she's been looking for. I am hoping that the brain gives me the answer. Dr. G and the Orlando Homicide Unit both believe that 34-year-old Gregory Flynn may have been murdered. There's blood on his shirt. He's face down in kind of a dark area in the dirt. So far, she's found no evidence of foul play. But she's yet to examine Greg's skull and brain. Head trauma could indicate that Greg was the victim of a fatal assault. Dr. G will also look for signs of natural disease. Maybe he's got a ruptured aneurysm or a stroke, something else going on that caused him to kind of act odd and lose control. I don't know. Dr. G reflects Gregory's scalp, looking for any sign of a fracture or wound. Anything going on in here? No impact site, no wound, no small gunshot wound that I missed. Nothing. But she can't entirely rule out trauma yet. A blow to the head could fatally injure the brain without fracturing the skull. There's no skull fracture, but that doesn't mean there's not bleeding in the brain. Next, morgue technician Brian Mikulski cuts through the skull with an oscillating saw. And Dr. G performs a thorough examination of the brain itself. I don't see any blood. The brain looked good. It was disappointing. I was open for something. There is no trauma anywhere on his body. I'm sorry we have to rule out trauma. <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of things it isn't. We just don't have what it is. By the end of the autopsy, big questions still remain. There is no trauma, but he's got blood all over him. I'm still suspicious that it's from his nose. I just don't see any residual blood in his nostrils. I told the detectives, if it's homicide, I don't know what kind of homicide it is besides a poisoning, because there is no trauma there. The police accept Dr. G's initial findings, but Greg's brother, Sean, finds it more difficult. I am getting multiple phone calls from his brother. He is sure his ex-wife murdered him. Sean now thinks Greg's ex-wife, Rosanna, must have poisoned him. This could explain why he ran his car into the ditch and stumbled around in a state of delirium in the hours before his death. But the only way Dr. G can prove it was murder is with the results of microscopic and toxicology tests. It takes two weeks to get Greg Flynn's processed tissue samples back for microscopic evaluation, but only moments to find a significant abnormality in his heart tissue. He's got a lot more fibrosis in his heart than I'd expect. When you look at cells in a normal heart, you see the pink uh, muscle cell. But with him, instead of nice pink cells, we see scar tissue replacing those cells. The fibrosis, or scar tissue, tells Dr. G that Greg's heart has been damaged over a long period of time. Though she doesn't think it could have killed him suddenly, seeing it gives her a crucial clue. She now thinks she knows how Greg Flynn died, but she can't prove it without the results of the toxicology. Back in her office, Dr. G digs into the lab reports. 
and it isn't long before they confirm her suspicions. It turns out that the theory that Greg was poisoned was partially correct. He was poisoned, all right. He poisoned himself. He was high on cocaine, extremely high on cocaine. Cocaine overdoses are hard to prove because drug levels fall after death. But even though his blood sample was taken 10 hours after his death, Greg Flynn's blood still had an extremely high level of cocaine. Now, the entire chain of events is beginning to make sense. The side effects caused by cocaine use can explain many of the curious details of Greg Flynn's final hours. Sometimes we see excited delirium with excited, kind of bizarre behavior, which it looked like he was having. It's a marker that he's having a bad reaction to the cocaine, and you can get these elevated body temperature. Dying with an abnormally high body temperature causes accelerated decomposition. This explains why Dr. G observed advanced decay in Greg Flynn's body. And cocaine even answers the question about the blood on Greg's shirt. Cocaine is a stimulant making the heart beat faster, making your blood pressure go up. The bloody nose was probably associated with the high blood pressure from the cocaine. Dr. G now believes prolonged use of cocaine probably caused the fibrosis and coronary artery disease she found in his heart. And I think he's probably a chronic cocaine user. But what ultimately killed him was a straightforward narcotic overdose, most likely triggering a fatal seizure or heart attack. When the blood pressure goes up, the heart beats harder, the coronaries constrict, the terminal event is usually the heart arrhythmia. An arrhythmia, where the heart's normal rhythm is disrupted, can often result in a heart attack. And although this is a common effect of cocaine overdose, Gregory could have also succumbed to a fatal brain seizure. Just like it can disrupt the electrical component of your heart, it disrupts the electrical aspect of your brain and precipitates seizures, and you can die that way also. So there's many ways that cocaine can kill you. But all it takes is one. Dr. G can now piece together the bizarre series of clues and describe step-by-step step the last moments of Gregory Flynn's life. On a cool September night, chronic cocaine abuser Gregory Flynn goes on yet another binge, snorting cocaine for hours. But this time is different. By the next morning, he's awake and high. And although he's a frequent user, he begins to feel ill. The cocaine uh, was starting to affect his brain and his blood pressure was going up. Greg is disoriented and his heart is pounding. His high blood pressure most likely triggers a severe nosebleed as he's driving. So he steers his car into the parking lot of an apartment complex. He makes a U-turn, his car goes into a ditch, then gets out of the car. By now, Greg's face is covered in blood from the nosebleed. Looking for help, he knocks on Debbie Balcom's apartment door. At this point, the cocaine is beginning to affect his thinking process, possibly inducing delirium and paranoia, and his body temperature is getting dangerously high. He's getting disoriented, confused. Unable to speak, Greg panics and runs into the patch of woods bordering the complex. At some point, he likely uses his shirt to stop his nosebleed, soaking up the blood. He probably jumps into a nearby creek in an attempt to cool off, which gets his clothing wet and also clears his nostrils of blood. Delirious, Greg races on through the woods, hitting branches and razor-sharp grass along the way, which scratch his arms. And then 
he collapses. He collapses either from the seizure or from a heart arrhythmia and then dies in that field. Dr. G immediately contacts the investigators to report her findings. Hi, this is Dr. Garibay at the medical examiner's office. She then calls Greg's brother, Sean, and breaks the news. He at first refused to believe it, but I think over time he's accepting it. Sean's brother, Gregory, kept his addiction well hidden from everyone in life. But in death, nothing can hide from Dr. G. Greg Flynn's death is a sad irony. Although it originally seemed tangled in mystery, in the end, it was tragically predictable. It's just another one of our drug deaths down here. It's epidemic. It's epidemic. Some days for Dr. G, it seems like every death is an accident that could have been avoided. But her next case stands out in the morgue as a truly unforeseen tragedy. It is devastating that those two children are left without a mom. For Dr. G, juggling multiple cases at once is just part of the job. But when it comes time to perform an autopsy, it's critical that she focus solely on the task at hand. The autopsy itself is beautiful, because although I have hundreds of cases upstairs that I have to think about when I'm doing the autopsy, I'm just doing one. And I'm only thinking about that one case. And nothing else in the world matters. But for Dr. G, cases aren't an escape. They're a challenge. He should have some scars around his face, too. Yeah, see it? I always prefer cases that are more of a challenge. I love unusual cases. You know, I get enough heart attacks down here that I don't need another one. When a really unusual case comes in, those are really the best. And her latest case definitely qualifies as unusual. This morning, we have a 42-year-old woman that uh, just had abdominoplasty surgery. She's got two kids, she's married, and she dies suddenly, two days after the procedure. Michelle Roan's tragic story actually started three years earlier, shortly after the birth of her first child. It was then that her battle with obesity began. By the time she had her second, the stay-at-home mom was over 200 pounds. At that point, Michelle decided she'd had enough. She committed to a strict diet and exercise regimen and lost more than 50 pounds. She felt great, except when she looked in the mirror. If someone's been overweight or obese for a long time and then they lose weight, then the skin will hang over in various areas. Uh, the most common place is the lower belly. Michelle is clearly unhappy with the excess skin around her middle. And after talking it over with her husband, Kevin, she decides to go ahead and schedule an abdominoplasty, or tummy tuck. This is to uh, remove some of that skin, tighten those abdominal muscles, remove some of that excess fat. 200,000 people will, will lose a tremendous amount of weight over this next year, and probably 75% will seek a plastic surgeon to kind of help them contour their body because of this excess skin. This is clearly an elective procedure for her, partly doing it to please her husband, partly doing it to please herself. By all accounts, the operation goes according to plan. And after three hours in surgery, the procedure is pronounced a success. The next day, her doctors send her home with a prescription for painkillers. But despite the powerful medication, the pain becomes so intense that Michelle is unable to get out of bed for 24 hours. Still, it seems like a relatively routine recovery from major surgery, nothing unusual. 
until 3 a.m. the following morning. She goes and takes some medication, and as she's going back to bed, she collapsed suddenly. Kevin scrambles out of bed and attempts to revive her. But to his horror, he realizes that she stopped breathing. Frantic, he dials 911. Paramedics arrive within minutes. They rush her to the emergency room, where doctors work on her for almost a full hour. They try to resuscitate her, but she was dead. They never could revive her. At this point, her husband and family's devastated. I, they can barely even talk. And, uh, and I'm sure they just want to know why she died, just like you know any of us would. It's now up to Dr. G to provide Michelle's family with some answers. Given the circumstances of her death, she suspects that complications from the surgery could have killed Michelle. Ten to twenty percent of patients develop complications during or after cosmetic surgery. Most are not serious, but abdominoplasty is one of the most invasive cosmetic procedures. Abdominoplasty uh, is not an operation that should be taken lightly. What you're doing is you're you know making a large incision across your lower abdomen. You're removing uh, part of your skin. Essentially, the underlying fat plus the skin is removed. Sometimes the muscle underneath is then tightened by an extra stitch, almost like a baseball stitch, sort of corseting you together, and then the skin is sewn together. And the list of potentially adverse outcomes is long. For one, Michelle could have contracted a fatal infection, either during surgery or while recovering. The CDC estimates probably about 88 to 90,000 deaths from hospital-acquired infections each year. Whenever you open the skin with surgery, you are decreasing uh, your skin barrier from infection and increasing your risk of infection. Another possibility is that Michelle developed blood clots in her legs at some point during her recovery. They can form after long periods of immobility then travel through the blood vessels to the heart, lungs, and brain, cutting off blood supply with deadly results. But because Michelle underwent liposuction, she's also at risk for fatal fat emboli, a problem specific to the procedure. The liposuction, you're breaking up the fat um, when they're trying to suck it out. Then you can cause damage to some of the small veins. These fat molecules and globules get into your vascular system and then could go to any organ. And with the fat emboli displacing blood supply, the body cannot absorb the oxygen it needs to survive. However, there's a chance that the culprit had been developing undetected in Michelle's body for years. Could just be natural disease and that the surgery had nothing to do with it. Although Michelle was no longer obese, her past weight gain could have triggered heart problems. If someone is obese um, or overweight, their heart has to pump much harder to carry that extra weight, and that can affect its health. Dr. G also can't ignore another potential scenario. Michelle may have overdosed on her powerful pain medication. She's given some potent narcotics, and you know, possibly she's taken too much. And there's one even more tragic possibility. If Michelle did overdose on painkillers, it may not have been an accident. There is clearly a syndrome of depression uh, after these body contouring uh, surgeries. After the surgery, you're in pain, you know, things are looking bad down there. You kind of get this depressive effect because stress hormones go down. Could Michelle have succumbed to a post-surgical depression and taken her own life? Michelle's family is desperate for answers, but with no immediate clues, only a full autopsy can solve the mystery of her sudden death. There's a lot of possibilities here. It'll be interesting to see what we find.
The first thing Dr. Jean notices as she begins the external exam is how hard doctors work to save Michelle's life. They have lines in both arms, they have a line in her neck, and they tried very, very hard to resuscitate her. It's a sad reminder of what a tremendous loss this was for Michelle's family. She's got two kids, four and two, which is just devastating to die and leave two children. But she has no time to dwell on the tragedy. As Dr. G begins examining Michelle's skin, she keeps an eye out for small reddish purple dots called petechiae. They occur when fat clots travel through the bloodstream and congest the small capillaries near the skin's surface. Petechiae could indicate the presence of deadly fat emboli, one of Dr. G's leading suspects. I don't see any of the petechiae, but that doesn't mean she doesn't have fat emboli. It's still a possibility. The only way to rule out fat emboli for sure is to examine tissue samples of Michelle's heart, lungs, and brain under the microscope. Another thing that Dr. G is hoping to find in the external exam is evidence of blood clots. These often form in the legs, causing one leg to swell up larger than the other. Brian, could you lift the leg up for me when I measure? Her legs don't look asymmetric. There's no pulmonary embolus that is obviously developed in her lower extremities. In fact, as she works her way up the entire body, Dr. G doesn't see any red flags at all. She looks like she's lost weight recently, but overall, she looks pretty good. The only thing that really doesn't look good is that incision across her abdomen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It looks painful. Dr. G carefully examines the 18-inch incision for telltale signs of infection. Now, the one thing, though, when you look at the scar is that it doesn't look infected. There's also no swelling under the wound. Blood or serum can collect there, but I don't see any hematoma or a large amount of blood. Still, Michelle's surgical site looks extremely painful. And this moves one of Dr. G's initial theories to the forefront. Just by looking at it, I'm thinking, oh, she must have overdosed on medication. Although Dr. G now suspects that Michelle Roan may have overdosed on painkillers following a tummy tuck operation, she still hasn't ruled out other causes of death, such as an infection or a botched surgery. I won't know for sure until I open that incision up. Because of Michelle's recent surgery, Dr. G does not begin the internal exam with a typical Y incision. In this case, I actually open up the incision, uh, the 18 inch incision that goes around her, her lower abdomen, because I want to see what that wound looks like. Dr. G carefully cuts through Michelle's stitches and reflects the skin. It looked painful. Where are those things coming from? But it didn't look infectious. All right. Finding nothing suspicious at the surgery site, Dr. G uses her scalpel to make a Y incision, opening up the torso from each of Michelle's shoulders, through her chest, all the way to the pelvic bone. First, she'll check the organs for any sign of accidental injury from the surgery. Her liver looks normal. Her spleen looks normal. There's no free blood, no uh, pus in her abdominal cavity. There's no perforation in her bowel. With no evidence of infection or surgical injury to Michelle's organs, it's looking like the surgery itself had absolutely nothing to do with her death. You know, I'm still wondering, maybe she took an overdose. An overdose of painkillers could have been accidental. 
or not. Some patients have been known to suffer psychologically after plastic surgery. There's some serious depression that can occur post body contouring surgery. They were feeling good before surgery, they're feeling terrible after surgery, they have these horrible scars, they're in a lot of pain, and they, you know, second guess their decision. Dr. G slices open Michelle's stomach, looking for evidence of an overdose. There's really nothing in her stomach. I don't see any pills or pill fragments or a bunch of pills that I would expect with an overdose. But there's only one way to tell for sure. And that's by drawing blood from Michelle's body for toxicology testing. So if this autopsy is negative at the end, I'm hoping that toxicology ends up positive. But toxicology aside, there's still critical work to be done. Dr. G must push on with the autopsy. Michelle's body has yet to reveal what killed her, and the possibilities are dwindling. Maybe it's just some natural disease process. Maybe she's got a bad heart. Maybe she's got something else going on that we don't know about. In the meantime, Michelle's husband and two young children anxiously wait for any information that may help them begin to come to terms with this tragic loss. I just hope we find a cause of death. There's nothing worse than a middle-aged woman that dies suddenly with no cause of death. So far, Dr. G hasn't found any evidence to suggest that 42-year-old Michelle Roan died from her recent tummy tuck. But Michelle's sudden collapse does point to a likely culprit, the painkiller she took minutes before. We see prescription drug narcotic overdoses all the time in this office. Uh, some of them are intentional, some of them are unintentional. But it will take weeks to get the toxicology results back from the lab. In the meantime, Dr. G continues the autopsy, looking for any clue as to what might have caused Michelle to die so suddenly. Based on the circumstances of her death, I'm going to really still look for a natural disease. Now look at her heart. That's really going to be where the money is for dying suddenly. Dr. G opens Michelle's rib cage and removes the heart. She then meticulously dissects every chamber and artery in the organ. There's no you know, evidence of scar tissue, any evidence of long-standing high blood pressure. Her looks good. Next, Dr. G turns her attention to Michelle's lungs. At first glance, they look healthy, judging by their size and color. You can't just look at the external aspect of a lung and figure out what went on. You gotta take it out and cut it. Carefully, she lifts the lungs up and uses her scalpel to detach them. She then begins dissecting the delicate tissue, and at that moment, she sees something horribly wrong. She's got bilateral pulmonary thromboemboli. Blood clots that formed and um, are occluding the main pulmonary arteries. The lung can't get any more blood from the heart, and it's incompatible with life. This is what killed her. But Dr. G's work isn't over yet. Even though I have the cause of death, I am curious what caused them. I need to know, well, where did she get these bilateral pulmonary emboli? You know, inquiring mind still want to know. The prime suspect, Michelle's legs, where blood clots are most likely to form. So we dissect the legs, and they don't have any residual clot in those legs. No, I can see. It's just all bloody. I don't see any clots. Determined to locate the source, Dr. G slowly moves upward on Michelle's body and soon finds her culprit, but not in the usual spot. I find some residual um, 
clots still in her pelvic vessels. Although blood clots usually form in the legs, in Michelle's body, they formed in her pelvic area, then broke free and traveled through her bloodstream before lodging in the lung's pulmonary arteries. A blood clot forming in the pelvic vein is more dangerous than a blood clot forming in the calf vein. The reason being is that the, the vein in the pelvis is much larger than the vein in the calf. So when a blood clot breaks off, if it breaks off from the pelvis, it's a larger blood clot and then can be much more fatal. This is the smoking gun she's been looking for. And finally, Dr. G can explain exactly how Michelle Roan's tummy tuck turned tragic. After an uneventful abdominoplasty and liposuction, 42-year-old mom Michelle Roan is recovering at home. She's bedbound and in pain. Still on the outside, everything appears normal. But inside her body, it's a completely different story. The tissue destruction from the surgery and liposuction causes blood to clot more readily. And her immobility during recovery makes it more sluggish. And that can lead to pulmonary emboli, the farming in the pelvic region. At around 3.30 a.m., Michelle's pain wakes her up. She crawls out of bed and makes her way to the bathroom for another dose of painkillers. But unbeknownst to her, the movements likely cause several blood clots to break free from her pelvic region. They go through her vascular system and plug up the pulmonary arteries going to the lung. As Michelle tries to get back into bed, her body, deprived of oxygen, suddenly begins to fail. She collapses. And within minutes, she's dead. That's one of the few things there you're walking, talking one minute, and you're dead on the floor the next. Michelle's sudden death has left her grieving husband, Kevin, desperate for answers. Now, Dr. G calls him with her findings. This is Dr. Garibay at the medical examiner's office. Yes. He just got the cause of death and hardly said a word. He certainly didn't want to talk to anybody about it. Oh, I would imagine that there was some tremendous guilt. It's unlikely that Kevin Roan ever thought his wife could die from the consequences of such a common procedure. The dangers for cosmetic surgery are minor, but they're real. You know, having pulmonary emboli, the complication of that is a little less than 1%, about a 0.08%, but it's real. She doesn't have anything that is going to put her at increased risk for the surgery. She's one of those unfortunate people uh, that had a bad complication. For Dr. G, Michelle's death is a powerful cautionary tale when it comes to elective plastic surgery. As long as you know the risk and the complications and it's still worth it for you, you know, go for it, especially if it makes you feel better. But the people she devastated the most with it are her children. You can't ever substitute for mommy.